I'd like to introduce our first guest tonight. He has come a long ways to be with us tonight, all the way from California, but not just California, by way of New Zealand, by way of Israel. And he has been a frequent guest and contributor on our program. He is with, he is actually the president of the American Freedom Alliance. In June, they put on the 800 year anniversary for the Magna Carta. And the American Freedom Alliance is a nonpartisan group that is fighting to defend Western cultural Judeo Christian principles. And I want to welcome to the platform my good friend Avi Davis. Avi? Much. Well, hello, Texas. Hello. You know, this is the one place uh, in the country where I don't have to explain wearing these boots. <laughs> in fact, they bought these boots here uh, maybe about 15 years ago, and they're, they are as rugged as I think that uh, the Texas people are because they've lasted me that long. Um, I want to speak to you tonight about Western civilization because the values and the ideals upon which our civilization rests are under assault. And uh, we're going to have an uh, opportunity to see a couple of videos tonight, and they're going to lead us off in uh, this Turn discussion. You Can you hear me? No. You can't hear me? You know, uh, I always worry that people can't understand what I'm saying because I have an Australian accent. And they always are. I've now lived in this country for 30 years more than half my life. And people ask me, how is it that you don't, your accent hasn't changed? And I tell them, well, my parents and grandparents paid a lot of money for this accent. <laughs> so I'm not giving it up that quickly. <laughs> I don't think I'm on. You have to turn me on? I don't understand. That's a loaded question. There we go. You're good. Right. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah that's that's better. Okay, now we're all set. <coughs> so do I have to repeat everything I said? Or did you? <laughs> That's to say the joke again about the accent. <laughs> I'm going to put this up. Okay, so look, what I want to talk to you tonight is uh, about the foundations. What is Western civilization? Western civilization is many things, but I want to, I want to reduce it to one basic principle. It's the idea of the individual's rights in society. The individual is elevated, his rights or her rights are elevated above the states. And that the power of those who govern us, govern us is constrained by a constitution or by the law of the land. In other words, the executive authority in the countries in which we live, the Western countries subscribe to, is constrained by, uh, by, by the law. So the, um, when we talk about the West, we're talking about countries that are joined by these values and uh, these ideals. But today, Western civilization is under tremendous pressure and assault. And I founded the American Freedom Alliance uh, 10 years ago because I, I, I wanted to understand what was happening to our civilization, why it was under such pressure. And it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle that we've been trying to piece together over all these years, these last 10 years. And what I'd like to do is present to you now a little video that we put together which will frame this discussion. And we'll be able to have a clearer understanding of what the issues are. And once we know what the issues are, then we can address them together. So uh, if whoever is running. John. The, if you would play the pieces of the puzzle video, it'd be very, very helpful. In the 18th century, the Enlightenment drawing upon the humanistic values of the Judeo-Christian tradition and the political legacy of the ancient Greeks and Romans, proposed a new way of thinking about human relations. Tolerance, openness to alternative viewpoints, the rights of citizens to participate in their own governance, and the guarantee of inalienable human rights 
all form the philosophical building blocks of what today we call Western civilization. But in every century since, the West has been forced to confront challenges it had never anticipated. In the 19th century, liberal democracy faced the challenges of rising monopolies and industrial giants dominating economic life. In the 20th century, the democracies were forced to confront the rise of fascism, communism, and were determined to destroy it. Now in this century, new challenges have arisen that are not so readily apparent. Understanding these threats leaves us with a puzzle, the pieces of which are fragmented and which we must try to gather together from disparate sources. Linked together, they possibly represent the greatest threats to Western democracy we have ever known. These are the pieces of the puzzle. The rise of Islam. Europe's submission to Islamic influence and its failure to adequately defend the values upon which its civilization was built. An excessive emphasis on multiculturalism. Demoting Western civilization is just another form of human organization equal to any other. The collapse of academic freedom, closing the doors on frank discussion about Islam's intent. The failure of the media to accurately portray the nature of the Islamic threat. The second puzzle piece is the assault on Judeo-Christian values. The growing cloud of atheism and its control over cultural ideas and values. Moral and cultural relativism, obliterating the boundary between right and wrong. The shattering of the division between pornography and art. The ebbing of tolerance, humility, and privacy. The rebirth of anti-Semitism. The third piece of the puzzle is the attack on human exceptionalism. The United Nations Agenda 21, a program and movement designed to radically alter human consumption and land use. The Animal Rights Movement and its anti-human agenda elevating animal and plant life above that of human. The global governance movement, asserting that boundaries between nations be removed and that the elite unelected bureaucracies should rule the world. Global warming hysteria, the unfounded notion that it is only humans that are at fault for unseasonable weather without reflection on alternative causes. These pieces form the basis of our concerns about the future of the West. We count on those with strong values and ideals to protect these values and to provide an enduring counterbalance to those who wish to destroy them. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that um, summarizes uh, the concerns that we have developed over the last 10 years regarding the threats that we face in the West and I want to talk to you tonight about uh, the four pillars of Western civilization, how they're under assault, and then what we can do to stand up to these assaults and regroup uh, in the face of such uh, devastating opposition. So the first, uh, there are four pillars. Let me just enumerate them for you for belief in God. The second is the family, the nuclear family. The third is free enterprise, and the fourth is democracy. These are spiritual, social, economic, and political values upon which the West stands today. All of them are under assault, and all of them are succumbing to uh, the pressures that is coming, coming at them from many different directions. So the first, of course, is God. You know, we're here in a church, and so I can speak quite freely to you about my concerns, about the assault on the idea of one God. Uh, and uh, from, uh, from what I've seen uh, happening, even in the last uh, several weeks, uh, we've seen this idea of uh, this diminution, this attack on, uh, uh, continuing attack on the concept of of uh, belief in one God and of religious belief in general. Uh, the, uh, all of you, of course, know the gay marriage case that was decided by the Supreme Court just a few weeks ago. For me, uh, and for many of you here I know, this was an attack on religious liberty. This, were, this was five justices essentially assuming 
that they could dictate to the rest of the country what our, um, our sexual uh, allowances should be in this country. The, the, the drive for gay marriage is not about bringing, giving happiness to gays, which is the case that is made over and over again, that gays deserve the same rights to happiness that all Americans have. Gays have the rights to happiness. Most gays in this country do not want to get married. In fact, most gays in this country don't even believe in monogamy. And this is something you don't hear people say. You don't hear the argument made enough that the gay population's drive is not about marriage. The drive of the gay community is power and control. Now I saw this firsthand. I saw firsthand about 15 years ago in California we passed a proposition called 27, Proposition 27. And this proposition uh, was the first statement uh, by the Californian people that, uh, that marriage is, is a union between a man and a woman. It's a reaffirmation of that idea. And the, the gay community in Los Angeles, at least, and actually over throughout most of the major cities in, in California, staged protests and uh, not quite riots, but significant protests. And I got caught in one. I got caught in one of these protests. I was driving down Wilshire Boulevard, which is the main thoroughfare of Los Angeles, one night at midnight, and coming towards me was a uh, rally. And the rally uh, had uh, posters and banners which said, honk if you support gay marriage. Now, I don't feel any need to honk to support gay marriage. I didn't feel any need at that time. I still don't feel any need to do it. Uh, but there was, every car around me was honking. And I refused to honk. And all of a sudden, I found my car surrounded by maybe about 15 men who started rocking the car back and forward as if doing that was gonna make me honk. Uh, I refused to do it. And you know, I, at, at that point, I really was in fear. I really was in fear and I realized that the gay movement is not a pacific movement whose, whose focus is on some kind of uh, equality before the war. It's a militant movement. It's an aggressive movement that is designed to change the narrative, the biological narrative in our society, to eliminate dead differences between men and women and between men and men, to erase the one of the fundamental aspects of uh, our society, which is the union between a man and woman and the nuclear family, and to confront those who believe otherwise and to destroy them. This is what is happening in our society today, and the, uh, the Supreme, Supreme Court decision of June 28th opened the door to that, and the justices I don't know if you, any of you have read the opinions. You can read them online. They're on the Supreme Court uh, website. Go and read the opinions. Read the majority opinion. One of the justices, or the, the, the writing for the majority, Justice Kennedy, he actually stated that, of course, those who believe in traditional marriage will have the opportunity to defend their beliefs. Defend our beliefs. <laughs> Can you, can you, I mean, 20 years ago, this would never have happened. Nobody, nobody was thinking about gay marriage 20 years ago. Even those who support it today. They, they, it wasn't on anybody's radar. How many gays are there in America? Some estimate, the greatest estimates are about 1.5% of the population is gay. Why is there now a tyranny over our narrative, our biological <coughs> narrative, over our social narrative, by this minority. We have succumbed, our Supreme Court succumbed to this. And the will of the people is not being observed. 
In California, we passed Proposition 8. Proposition 8 was a, was a reaffirmation of the Proposition 27 that I just spoke about. And um, it went before the California Supreme Court, and one justice, it, it, was, it, it, it affirmed uh, that marriage uh, is uh, that marriage is a union between man and woman. It went before a, um, uh, the California Supreme Court, and one justice, one justice decided that the will of the people should be ignored. Will of the people should be ignored, and that his view that in fairness to the gays, they should have the right that it is unconstitutional, unconstitutional for those who uh, those who wish to express, who have, who have supported the idea of a marriage that's been between a man and a woman, for them to impose that on those who oppose, who, who oppose it. And uh, of course this went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court threw the case back. In other words, wouldn't even hear the case, which means that gay marriage is, is legal in California. And that all became irrelevant, of course, in uh, uh, last month, in June, when the Supreme Court said that every state must uh, support uh, gay marriage. So this is one of, the, uh, one of the most significant assaults that we see today, the assault on, on uh, the family as a social foundation of, the, uh, of Western civilization, and the, and the assault on God, or the idea of God. And of course we see uh, uh, assaults on democracy and free enterprise almost every day. The Obama administration uh, basically has, has eroded the idea that free enterprise should be encouraged. That, that, um, that those who wish to establish their own small businesses and, and prosper through their own labor shouldn't be given the kind of support and encouragement that has built this nation. Who's read or had a chance to review Democracy in America by Alex de Tocqueville? Do you know, does that ring a bell? Alex de Tocqueville wrote in the 1830s one of the most important books ever written about democracy. It's called Democracy in America. He came here when we were still a young country. And he saw and he understood that the freedom that we enjoy in this country is built upon free enterprise. It is built upon economic prosperity that that free enterprise allows. And he said that if you suffocate free enterprise in America, if you do not encourage it and do not support it, you will lose your freedoms. And that's exactly what is starting to happen in this country. Uh, Barack Obama famously said uh, in 2008 to Joe the Plumber, I think he's Joe the Plumber's from Texas, is that right? No. Ohio. With Ohio, okay. <coughs> sort of close. <laughs> uh, Closer then than now. Yeah. <laughs> so he said that, uh, that uh, you didn't build it. You didn't build your enterprise. You didn't build your, uh, your company. We did. The government did. Because we provided you with the roads. And we provide you with the infrastructure. And we provide you with the political framework in which you could build your business. Well, of course, this created a firestorm of protest. But it was an indication of where he was going. And Barack Obama, since that time, has launched attack upon attack upon millionaires and billionaires, right? Despite being one himself, mind you. Millionaires and billionaires, those who, who and, and included in that, are people who make over $250,000 a year. You know, and it's become a, um, a, a constant mantra and statement from the Obama administration. And he's, they've used the IRS to go after people who are successful in this country. It's a, it's a telling indication. Now, what we hear from the Democratic Party is more of this, not less. Those of you who've uh, been watching Hillary Clinton and what she's been saying on the stump, 
is it's ast absolutely astounding. She is harkening back to a socialist past in a democratic party, as if there were no, there'd been no successes, no successes whatsoever uh, in terms of the growth of the American economy over the last 50 years as a result of the re relaxation of the regulation of, of the economy. They want to return us to a regulated, uh, controlled, bureaucratic government, which dictates how our economy grows. This is a prescription for disaster. And how do we know that? How do we know? Let's look at Europe. Let's look at what's happened in Europe. The collapse of free enterprise in Europe. Labor laws which have constricted and made it almost impossible for anybody to lose a job. If you get a job in Europe today, particularly in the uh, public sector, in the government, in, in the government, you can never be fired. Even if you don't show up for work, you can, be, you can never be fired. There's practical tenure amongst the, uh, amongst the Europeans today. And uh, this is the kind of model that the Obama administration, the Democratic Party, and Hillary Clinton thinks that is going to lead to our happiness and to our growth and prosperity. It will never lead to growth and prosperity. Now let's talk a little bit about democracy and the political aspect of things, because this is probably the most worrying thing of all. We've seen this administration take executive action on things such as immigration, um, where, the, uh, where the president has used his authority to override Congress. The idea that we have a constitution that controls and circumscribes the power of the executive is something that Obama, the Obama administration is very uncomfortable extremely a couple and, and has consistently sought to avoid it. And we saw this, of course, with the Iran deal. Just this week, just this week, the Iran deal was signed in Vienna on the 14th of July. And the requirement and the traditional path would be for Barack Obama and John Kerry to pr present this agreement to Congress for review and ratification. No. The Obama administration said, this is not a treaty. This is an executive agreement that I have, that I have negotiated. And so there was special legislation passed by, the, by Congress requiring the president to present it. What did the president do? He decided to do an end run around Congress. He took this agreement and presented it to the Security Council of the United Nations. What does that mean? And the United Nations Security Council then ratified it, essentially transforming it into international law. Which means that if Congress then refuses to ratify the agreement, they are putting the United States in violation of international law. Do you understand what this means? This means that the Obama administration has essentially surrendered American sovereignty because the Obama administration and many members of the Democratic Party today don't believe in American sovereignty. They don't believe in the democratic process. They believe in global governance. And what is global governance? It's not one country ruling everybody else. It is being ruled by an unelected bureaucracy that dictates, dictates to us what we can grow in our backyards, what we, we can put in our fields, what we can, what we can uh, spew into our uh, environment. It is a form of control, global governance, would subvert the American Constitution, the US Constitution. It would control our lives completely 
without our representation. And we see this happening in Europe. The European Union is an attack on democracy. The European Union will not allow, does not have representatives uh, giving their uh, assent to dictates from the bureaucracy. 70% of the laws in England today come from the European Union. The English people who, are, where, where democracy had its found, modern democracy, liberal democracy, had its, its origins, are now subject to a unelected bureaucracy in Europe. And if you want to read exactly what is happening, then I suggest you uh, look to the work of Daniel Hannan. Daniel Hannan is a member of the European Parliament for Southwest England, and uh, a brilliant mind. And he will tell you, he sits in that Parliament, and he'll tell you every day on his blog and, and in articles he write that this is the road to serfdom. This is the road back into our past, not the road forward. And he's warning, he's been warning America for years, don't go down this path. But that's the path that our government is following. That's the path that Hillary Clinton will take us as well. It is a direct assault on democracy. It's a direct assault on the political environment that we've established in this country. And uh, we have to be aware of it. And we have to be aware that global governance is not just some airy-fairy term. It's actually happening. <coughs> I'll also talk about international law and the international human rights law. Non-governmental organizations, NGOs. You all heard of that expression, NGOs? Non-governmental organizations are those who are they're like, I'll give you an example, Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Watch, um, Doctors Without Borders. These are all uh, vaunted as, as uh, operating in the name of uh, human rights and of individual liberty. But they are not at all. They are instruments of the global governance uh, global governance movement. They seeking. They have sought to impose international law, uh, international human rights law, over our constitution, which would mean that our constitution, our uh, our laws are subject to an international regime of human rights dictates, which do not, which constrain our sovereignty. Uh, and let's talk about a little bit about radical environmentalism and uh, the, the religion of radical environmentalism and the impact that that is having on our, uh, on our country. Because all of you are well aware that environmental policies are having a significant impact on our way of life and our standard of living. I'll give you an example. In California, we pay a dollar twenty, a dollar, a dollar twenty cents more than any other state in the country for our gas. A gallon, I should say. Dollar twenty more a gallon. Why is that? Because the state has mandated that every every gallon of gas has to contain a certain percentage of ethanol. And the ethanol, there's only two refineries in the entire state. And this is a state for, you know, 32 million people. Two refineries that can produce that kind of, that kind of mix. Um, it requires uh, such an amount of uh, uh, technical finesse that they can't produce enough of it. And of course, when you can't produce enough, the, there's not enough quantity, the price goes up. So we pay $1.20 more in California because of mad environmental regulations which have no bearing in science, no, no foundation in science, and have no bearing on the environment at all. So this is an example of, of environmental policy gone crazy. Another case, everybody's heard about the California drought? 
No, you haven't heard about the California drought? Yes, you have. Yeah. 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 All right, we have a drought. The so-called drought, it is a man-made drought. California has plenty of water. 42 million acres of it. But 25% of it is washed out to the sea. Why? Why? Because of environmental, environmental demands on that water. In other words, uh, an example, of course, is the famous Delta smelt. <coughs> Delta smelt, the tiny little fish that is, uh, was declared endangered maybe 20 years ago. So, um, in order not to flood the rivers, they've siphoned off um, uh, snow melt, which is substantial from the Sierra Mountains, and it's washed out in the center, in, in, in the set, into the San, San Francisco Bay. Something like 24 billion gallons of water, fresh water, that could be used for agriculture. The uh, farmers can only use 40% of their allotment. We had a program called the California Land and Water Wars, uh, maybe a year ago. You can see it on the American Freedom Alliance website. And this is what we realize is that the farmers are dying. The Central Valley, which produces something like 50% of the produce for this country, the, one of the richest, most fertile valleys in the world, is being drained of its water. It can, they can, the farmers cannot produce any longer because the environmentalists want to save the Delta smelt. And here's the irony. They did a study to find the Delta smelt. You know, 20 years of preserving Delta smelt, you think, it's become a uh, huge population. Guess what? They can only find seven of them. <laughs> they found seven Delta smelt. Right. So here you have another example of environmentalism gone crazy. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. I'll give you another example. Um, in uh, California, we, we have uh, restrictions on diesel fuel, on the amount of diesel fuel that uh, trucks can uh, use. And um, there was a scientist by the name of Jim Enstrom, he's actually a member of my board, professor at UCLA, who did an exhaustive study, a 10-year study, on whether diesel fuel particulates were causing ill health in children in California. His study proved that they didn't. It just didn't. There was no evidence for it, no scientific fact. He was forced to retire from UCLA yeah. for that decision, yeah. for, that, for that study. He fought back. He fought back and he won a settlement from UCLA for wrong, wrongful termination. But it doesn't change anything. The fact is that environmentalism doesn't rely on science. The entire global warming industry, industry, I call it industry because that's exactly what it is. The global warming industry doesn't rely on science. Science is, in the inc is the inconvenient fact, or the inconvenient truth. The science actually shows that there hasn't been any global warming in 17 years. The computer models that were put together in the 1990s have proven false. And yet, every single day you read about disaster that is coming upon us. The glaciers in the Arctic are not melting. In fact, they're growing. The polar bears are not disappearing. I had a conversation with my son's uh, science teacher. This is my son's science teacher in a private, private Jewish day school in Los Angeles. And I, and I said to him, you know, have you, he, he presents the case of global warming as many uh, as, as the California curriculum requires him to. I said, have you, have you considered the countervailing arguments? Have you, have, you, have you drawn upon opposing views on this subject? He said, well, what opposing views? This is <laughs> consensus. 97% of scientists agree. I said, where did you find that figure, that 97%? Have you found out where that figure came from? 97%. It came from a sampling of 500 scientists. 500 scientists does not provide a sample of worldwide consensus. And he said, well, you know what? 
I just feel sorry for the polar bears. That's the, it's a science, that's the scientific argument. I feel sorry for the polar bears. I'm feel, I feel like I should write a book with that title. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, you know, the environmental argument has become an emotional argument. It's all about emotion. It's because we, we are human beings, therefore we must be guilty. This ipso facto, we are guilty because we are human beings. In fact, it is human beings who pollute. They are the pollution. They are the problem. They are the issue. And this gives rise to something called Agenda 21. Who in this room knows what Agenda 21 is? Ah, oh, how wonderful. Because when I mention that, even to conservatives in California, nobody knows. <laughs> And you know what? That is a great. Right? This is Texas. You're yeah, this Texas. Is Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wore the boots. Agenda 21 is the most pernicious, underhand, um, subversive program uh, that has ever been visited upon the United States. And it's right here. It's right. Your councils are adopting. Its principles and ideas, of course, are not called Agenda 21. It goes under all kinds of different names, but whenever you hear the word sustainability, that's Agenda 21. The idea that we are unsustainable, that's Agenda 21. The fact that the, the drive of Agenda 21 to force humanity into smaller and smaller urban areas so that we don't infringe on the environment. That's Agenda 21. That they want us to live in high rises. And they want to declare more and more land, particularly agricultural land, to be wildland. Not to be visited by human beings because it is sacred. It is sacred. Why is it sacred? Because it belongs to Gaia or to the Mother Earth. Okay, this is the new religion. This is the new religion. I have to tell you, my friends, that I come across it all the time. Everywhere I go, the people are convinced that human beings are responsible for the devastations on this planet, when, in fact, we have achieved an enormous success in controlling environmental damage in this country. The more prosperous a country becomes, the more likely it is to going to have environmental consciousness and control any environmental pollutions. And um, you see this around the world. Everywhere you go, you can see the success of uh, countries in, in dealing, in cleaning their air, in cleaning their water, making it possible. You know, when I came to Los Angeles 30 years ago, when I flew over Los Angeles, I couldn't even see the city. I was, <laughs> we were about, you know, about a mile up. And I asked uh, the, uh, the uh, flight attendant, where's, where's Los Angeles? And she said, it's under, under the smog. <laughs> Today, anybody goes to Los Angeles, you don't see smog. We've been successful in controlling the smog. We've got clean water. We've got clean air. But it's not enough for the environmentalists. It's just not enough. An environmentalist sees a city and they see evil. That's evil. And this is this is one of the great uh, this is one of our tremendous uh, challenges to deal with radical environmentalists because they've they've made a religion out of environmentalism. They have transformed the the the, the, the drive for conservation. Look, I'm a, I actually love like, nature. I love being outdoors. I love experiencing national parks. I think they're an extraordinary achievement. They're a wise use of land. Um, they're a natural heritage of the United States. But I don't believe that those national parks should exist at the expense of human life. And this is where we, we, where we come to the divide with the environmentalists. Human life is the most sacred value of Western civilization. It underpins the West.
for the secular, secularness of human life. The environmentalists see the environment as more important than human life and will sacrifice human life in order that their environmental causes are obtained. And of course, this, is, this underpins uh, many other causes as well. The idea that human life is not sacred. Look at the abortion issue. Look what's happened. You know, the Planned Parenthood. I don't know if you've read, if you read the Wall Street Journal, there was an article in just yesterday about Planned Parenthood and the revelations how uh, doctors talk about not having crunchy abortions so they can harvest the, um, the organs of fetuses. Now, of course, the, the abortionists, the abortion lobby says they're not human beings. That these are not human beings, these fetuses and these uh, embryos, they're not human beings. But you can use their organs still to give to other human beings? How does that work? The abortion lobby has become another, uh, another uh, byword for murder. Now, I stood on the fence on this issue for a long time. Until a couple of years ago, I went to a, um, a CPAC, the Conservative uh, Political Action Committee, it meets in Washington once a year as a big convention. And there I saw um, models of embryos, life-size models of embryos. And from almost a, uh, from a, uh, there's probably some doctors in this audience, but in, from a few months, from a, maybe a few weeks, six weeks, you can see these embryos as human. There's absolutely no doubt they're human. They have the, they have the body of a human being. And to think that we are taking these embryos, destroying them, destroying it is incontestably a destruction of human life. It is murder. It is murder. And, I, and I've come around to that opinion because I've now seen it. And uh, so, but this is, but to many uh, progressives and liberals, those of us who stand against abortion, those of us who stand against gay marriage, are standing against progress. Because human life isn't valued anymore. That traditional values aren't valued anymore. That we are somehow, we who who profess traditional values and traditional mores and traditional um, attitudes. Things that were the basis, the values which were the basis of the founding of this country are somehow like Neanderthals. We're living in another world. We're living in a, in a world that has disappeared because progress is pushing us along and humanity, humanity is the problem. And of course, you know, the abortion debate is relevant also to demography, just as the gay marriage debate is as well. There's a book written by Jonathan Last from the um, American Enterprise Institute. It's called What to Expect When No One's Expecting. And he says in this book, and he's very convincing, he provides statistics, the idea that there is this sort of Malthusian um, uh, overpopulation of the planet that is drowning us and is going to kill us is, is absolute nonsense. All over the world, populations are declining. In Africa, in the Middle East, it is a crisis. In Europe, in Italy, they can't find young people anymore to take the jobs necessary. That's why they have to import whole populations to do the dirty stuff that most Italians don't want to do any longer. And that's becoming the case all over Europe and all over the world. China, its one-child policy has proved an absolute failure. They don't have enough. They don't have enough births to replace deaths. And we only have enough births to replace deaths in this country because of illegal immigration. That's the only way we, we've, we've been able to sustain our own population. Otherwise, we'd be in decline as well, because more and more people don't want to get, either get married or they don't want to have children. How many people have you met who said to you, 
I don't think we should have children. Because why would I bring more human beings into this world to, uh, to just mess it up? I, I find this from young women all the time, you know, saying things to me that, you know, the natural instinct of a woman is to want to have children, is to produce children. It's part of our DNA, it's part of our, it's part of our uh, objective in life, it's part of a, a woman's mission, and I'd say it's part of a man's mission too, to have a family. And that is being denied. That people are denying themselves that because they feel it's going to have a negative impact upon our world. Uh, I have um, I've spent the last 10 years addressing these issues and watching the patterns grow in our society of, and, and of course, the last eight years or the last seven years, watching the above administration adopt many of these policies. Uh, Barack Obama came into office not being a supporter of, uh, of abortion, not being a supporter of gay marriage, in fact, he was quite adamant that marriage, until only a year ago, that marriage is a uh, union between a man and a woman. But now he's going to Africa and preaching, or he's going all around the world, preaching gay rights. How did this happen? How did it happen that our president became the poster boy for gay rights? That this is the, one of the great, uh, tremendous achieve, achievements of the American Republic that we've given rights to gays to be married. It's one of the most astonishing developments, that are, historical developments that I've ever seen, and social developments I've ever seen. It's because we have allowed it to happen. We haven't been strong enough and firm enough and determined enough to stand up to those people. Look, I have to tell you, even in the conservative movement, there are people who say to me, you know, what does it matter? What does it matter if the gays get married and have children, adopt children? And, I mean, does it really have any impact on our lives? Well, here's what's going to happen. Eventually, you're going to be sending your kids to school, and they'll be, they'll be reading books, not just about Jack and Jill going up the hill, but Jack and Jack going up the hill. You're going to be seeing your children told that there are alternatives to being married to a boy or a girl, whatever the gender is, that there are that, that uh, the happiness does not necessarily depend on finding a spouse of your opposite sex, but maybe somebody of the same sex or of an unknown sex. <laughs> right? How many of you have been disturbed by the attention that Bruce Jenner, one of our great, one of the great heroes of American life, really? I mean, he was an a, a Olympic medalist. He was on every box of cereal that I can remember from growing up. How many of you have been disturbed by the attention he's received uh, at the, the you know, Vanity Fair? puts him on a cover like a cover girl. Um, he's getting a spread in Playboy. Yeah. I know, it, sound, it, it's, it's, it's taste, it sounds tasteless, but that's where we are. He is a hero for being transgender. And, we're being put, and this is all being pushed by a media that has, lo has, has lost its bearings, <laughs> has been rocked off its moorings. Our entertainment industry, our news services, our reporters uh, are all part of this desire to undo the bases and the pillars of Western civilization. And, uh, and, and the Jenna, Jenna uh, episode is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Is just the beginning. Those people who say, you know, when I say to people after the uh, gay marriage decision, um, where do you think this is going to lead? I mean, do you see down the road uh, polygamy coming up as an issue that, that, it, that marriage shouldn't be defined as just between a man and a woman, 
between a man and a woman. Where do you see it going perhaps when somebody says, well, I'm a pederast, and I can't help but being, I can't help being a pederast. That's just who I am. I like little boys. What can I do about it? That's why I was born. That's in my DNA. Why shouldn't I marry an eight-year-old boy? Why shouldn't I marry an eight-year-old girl? But that's where it's heading. That's the slippery slope that we're sliding down. And I'm, and I'm telling my friends that this is something that we, who believe in traditional values, who believe in Judeo-Christian values, must fight. And that's now how I come to the issue of what can be done. I'm a very firm believer in the idea of Jews and Christians standing shoulder to shoulder on issues related to the future of the West. Now, and I'm sorry to say, I'm Jewish and I find amongst my Jewish compatriots an uh, unwillingness to adopt my stance. 80% of the Jews in this country, or 75%, uh, voted for Obama, uh, Barack Obama. Would they, would they again? Uh, well, that's a very good question because what is happening with Israel today, the abandonment and isolation of Israel may change a few months, but I don't think so. I think that, yes, they would vote for, for Barack Obama again, uh, and they'd vote for Hillary Clinton. And I'm sorry to say that. Why will they do that? That's a very good question. Um, and, I, and there's a whole book written by, by Norman Pod Horace called Why Are Jews Liberal? Uh, it's not that Jews are uh, even liberal these days. Jews are progressive. Jews in this country have abandoned Judaism and the values of Judaism and replaced it with liberalism. It's a new religion. It embraces things which were antithetical to Judaism, such as abortion and gay rights and, uh, uh, and a controlled economy. Things that were never part of Jewish tradition or Jewish values or Jewish or, or the or Jewish religious uh, practice. It's unrecognizable. The great sages of, of Judaism would be, would, would seeing what has happened to Judaism in general in this country, would be shocked and horrified at what the misinterpretation of Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition isn't about repairing the world, as you'll hear many Jew, progressive Jews say. It's about living a values and ideals consistent with God's word. And I'm very sorry to say that it's become a, uh, it's become a, it's become a tremendous embarrassment to me and to other Orthodox Jews who see the, the erosion of our values. But there is a growing Orthodox population here in the, in the United States of Orthodox Jews. And of course there's an extremely strong evangelical community. But let's talk about the evangelical because I do not believe the evangelical community has awoken in this country. I think that it is still very much asleep, that it is not politically engaged, that those people who, who could make a significant difference throughout politics to the political direction of this country are not engaged. And so, People like myself are speaking more and more in churches. Ted Cruz's entire um, uh, campaign, at least from what I heard from him personally, uh, I wouldn't say the entire campaign, but a significant segment of it is focused on the evangelical community because he knows that he represents the values and ideals that that most uh, most Christians support. So I'm not. This isn't a stump speech for uh, uh, for Ted Cruz. But, it's okay uh, if it was. It can be okay if it was. But um, but I do believe that we are. Uh, we need a candidate like this. We need somebody who is going to represent our point of view. So. Uh, I also, so there are other candidates, of course, like Scott Walker, who I firmly believe is a, is a very good candidate for uh, president, but I'm not here to endorse anyone. I'm here to tell you that we have to find leaders who understand 
the problems that we face, and the challenges we face, and the threats we face to the West. Um, on all manner of issues, I haven't spoken very much about the Iran deal here, but the Iran represents a capitulation of the United States to a force that is committed to its destruction. It's, it represents an abandonment of our most important allies in the Middle East, namely the State of Israel. We've just let the, hung them out to dry and given Iran a path to nuclear power and to a nuclear bomb which it could threaten its neighbors and threaten the United States in the future. It is the worst example of dip diplomatic capitulation since Munich in 1938. And there are significant comparisons between the way that Obama has conducted himself now and the way that Neville Chamberlain, as a leader of the West, conducted himself in 1938. We need to bring, you know, unfortunately, our president doesn't have much of a historical memory. You know that every president since 1938, including Franklin Roosevelt, all the way up to George W. Bush, invoked the specter of Munich in their speeches. It became the cornerstone of American diplomacy that we had to, we had to stand up to authoritarians. We had to stand up to tyrants. We couldn't negotiate with them if they were still committed to our destruction. Well, what was the first thing that happened after this agreement was signed? July 14th? July 15th, you see the leader of Iran, the Supreme Leader, Khamenei, addressing a crowd that was screaming death to America. The very next day, a Rouhani, the President, saying that this changes nothing in our relations and our rejection of the West. They don't want an agreement. What they want is a pathway to domination is exactly what happened in 1938 with Adolf Hitler. We have to fight back against this. We have to pressure our representatives who are now debating this terrible agreement, this bad decision, this bad act of diplomacy. We have to challenge them and we have to force them to say, no, this is not going to pass. This will lead to, this will represent us as a weak nation, and this will lead to the destruction of our allies, and then our own destruction, possibly in 10 years' time. We have to stand up to that. I uh, uh, want to conclude today just by uh, showing you a little bit about the American Freedom Alliance. I've got a video here. It's actually um, from last year. This is the most current version. Um, we can, yeah. We're not going to have time. We don't have time to show it. Okay, I'm sorry, I've run over. Um, but maybe we can show it at another, another point in time. Uh, I want to thank you all very, very much for allowing me to address you. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm sorry if I've been the bearer of bad tidings. But I do hope that uh, you, you see this as a challenge. You see what I've spoken about today as a challenge, as a means of gathering information. There are three things I want to uh, leave you with regarding what you can do. The first is education. You need to educate yourselves about what is happening in the world, and you need to educate your children and your grandchildren. You need to teach them what is happening and what we're standing for. Education. The second thing is building alliances. Find other peoples and other communities who support the, these, these the, who are recognized challenges and are willing to go out and, uh, um, and, 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 and uh, educate others, build alliances. And the third thing, of course, is advocacy. Wherever you can find it, find uh, forums where you can speak to your representatives in Congress and make them aware that you are not happy with the way things are going, The things have to change. And I'm hoping that um, that with uh, some of these things that we can, we can finally unite and we can force change, and we can reverse the
the progressive direction of this country and, uh, and restore the American public to its, its true glory. Thank you very, very much. It's a, it's a pamphlet called Appeasement. We wrote it at uh, the time of the, uh, of the 70th anniversary of the Munich Agreement in uh, 2008, but it's just as relevant today. Uh, it, it contains some wonderful essays by some extraordinary people. I encourage you to, to take a look at it. If you want to purchase it, I think uh, it's $10, and it's well worth it because it will give you information that you really need. And it'll help support the American Freedom Alliance as well. Yes, it will. Now we thank you so very much.